so today we're going to be talking about uh, a very important topic, which is, I think, relevant to all of us in every aspect of our lives. We're going to be talking about trash collection, how trash collection can be transformed using machine learning. Now, this is important. We I know, deal with this every day in our personal lives at home, at work, uh, commute, public places. I can go on and on. So, uh, so very important topic, very close to my heart. And uh, it is my pleasure to be joined by Dr. Arndt Hendrickson, who is uh, the CEO of uh, Zolotron Technology from Germany, uh, who will be coming up uh, in a bit. And he is going to talk about how Zolotron has used machine learning to transform the process of trash collection and how uh, their customers have used this effectively. My name is uh, Sham Srinivasan. I'm part of the uh, product marketing team uh, at AWS. I focus on AI ML. I focus on machine learning services. Passion is to talk to customers like you. Uh, learning about use cases, I learn all the time. It's been a fascinating week for me personally. I hope it's been for you where we have talked about so many interesting topics. Uh, you know, and very focused conference, and we're glad we could have you all here. Uh, quick round on the agenda. I mean, obviously, we're going to talk about uh, machine learning. What I'm going to talk about is machine learning at AWS. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on uh, our flagship service uh, called Amazon SageMaker. You might have heard this in the keynotes. Uh, Dr. Werner Vogel talked about it yesterday, in, and, and uh, perhaps uh, you talked to some of us at the Tech Showcase. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on SageMaker, and then uh, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Ant, who's been going to talk about uh, Zolotron and how they are using SageMaker in their business. Now, this is uh, a moot slide. It's, it's, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, we've seen through the week, and uh, hopefully you've seen that machine learning is here to stay. It's no more a fad. It's not something which is focused on you know, a particular set of individuals. And our mission at uh, AWS and Amazon is to put machine learning in the hands of every developer and every data scientist. So literally to democratize machine learning, uh, not make it as an exclusive technology, which perhaps was maybe about 10 years back, even five years back, I should say. Uh, and we are seeing this in our everyday lives. Uh, when I talk about everyday lives, you know, you see it in your commute. Your, you know, the way we interact with our devices, uh, we are on our phones, our, uh, our laptops, our tablets, and what have you, and seeing what the, what the traffic is, right? Uh, when we shop on Amazon, uh, which is driven on the back end by machine learning, when uh, online content delivery, right? Uh, it, machine learning is telling us uh, what to watch, recommendations, and of course, one of the key aspects of this conference at Remars Robotics. Uh, hopefully, you've seen some of these sessions uh, here, including the tech showcase, where robotics as a technology is being driven on the back end by machine learning. And of course, things like which I've been doing for decades and since mankind started, finance and operations, and so on and so forth. So the point is that machine learning is here to stay. It's permeating into different aspects of our lives. And we are fortunate to be part of this journey, and we can't wait what lies ahead. Now, within, within Amazon, uh, the way we look at machine learning is uh, it's a three-layer stack, right? Uh, so why did we put this three-layer stack? Is to reiterate the point I talked about earlier, to talk about machine learning to be applicable to every developer and every data scientist, irrespective of your skill level. So if I could kind of go over this, uh, right on the start, uh, on the top layer is uh, what we name it as AI services. I call it the easy button for machine learning. Why do I call it so? Because for this layer, the services on this layer is for primarily targeted towards application developers who may or may not be familiar with machine learning. Right? You know what you got to do to build your applications. Now, what we help and enable there is to make those applications more intelligent, make it better for your business, so that you can reap the benefits and reach your business goals. Now, these AI services have different themes, and I've named a few there, uh, be it uh, vision to maybe recognize images or personalities in a video uh, or you know, extract information from a text document, 
could be in the areas of speech, uh, language for things like translation, for transcription. Uh, you might want to build a chatbot for making your perhaps call center better or making customer service easier for your business. Right? And uh, you know, some of the other things which we have launched recently is about uh, things like recommendation. So the technology, what we use at Amazon.com on the retail website, uh, for example, when you shop on Amazon, uh, you're shop as an example, if you're shopping for a, a computer or a laptop, right, uh, then uh, you also see, you know, customers have also purchased maybe a keyboard, a mouse, a monitor, right, related items. Now, that is driven by machine learning. Now, you don't see things like, you know, if you uh, look for a laptop or a computer, you don't see, you know, uh, customers have also bought a bouquet of roses. Doesn't make sense. So, right, so the recommendation engine at the back end, and that's what we give you here. So if you want to build such a recommendation system for your own business, the only thing you've got to do is to use those APIs. So it's a matter of a single API call, which you would make using your application and make your application smarter, intelligent, and more applicable for your business. So the AI services layer is primarily catered towards those kind of use cases or applications where you ha you're simply using the APIs to make your applications better. Moving down the stack, uh, the middle layer is where the focus of uh, today's presentation uh, will be, where what is the machine learning services, and the focus of that is our flagship service. It's a service called Amazon SageMaker. Uh, we launched SageMaker when we talked to our customers Everything which we build at Amazon is driven by customer feedback, right? Our roadmap, our products, our services, everything is, when we talk to customers, we work on this process called working backwards, where we say, how would this product look like if it was in the hands of a customer? We write the PR when we start the project, and then we write the code. So it's a backward process, and we are very proud of that uh, you know, process that we use at Amazon. So going back to SageMaker, uh, the SageMaker was a service which we launched about 18 months back. And uh, I'll give you the reasons behind why we built SageMaker in a minute in the next slide. But it is primarily catered towards people who have familiarity towards machine learning, right? who know what it takes to build, train, and deploy a machine learning model. And how to overcome those barriers is why we built SageMaker. Now, when we launched SageMaker, it was a single service. Uh, you know, it was a service where uh, you know, people could choose what module to use. But over the course of time in the last 18 months, which is not too long but not too short either, based again on feedback from customers, SageMaker has grown to be a suite of services. And you'll understand why I'm talking that, because SageMaker is not a single service, although we talk about it in, in, a, in a single uh, way, but it has grown to be a suite of services to uh, cater to every aspect of machine learning based on customer feedback. And the <coughs> squares which you see in the middle layer there are those aspects of the suite of services. And I'll go into detail for each one of them. Uh, the last but not the least, the bottom layer is uh, the frameworks and infrastructure. It serves two purposes. One is it is the complementary layer to the machine learning services layer. That is, it uses SageMaker as a service. For example, it uses those frameworks, those deep learning frameworks, the infrastructure which is needed to uh, you know, train and deploy the models because infrastructure needs to be manageable, needs to be scalable to cater to the different seasonalities and requirements of any business. So that is the foundation or that is the complementary aspect to SageMaker. On the other hand, the second purpose is that there are these set of customers who are, whom we talk as advanced practitioners. Now, these are folks who are advanced research uh, scientists, perhaps, who are telling us that, you know what, we know what framework to use. We know what is the actual algorithm to use, but give us that flexibility. Give us so that we have complete control and we can manage it ourselves. So there are two aspects of customers. One who are asking for, you know what, I don't know what this is. Can you manage it for me? That's perfectly fine. And as on the other end of the spectrum is that I've, I want that complete flexibility, complete control, so that I can do it on my own. So that's what is the frameworks and infrastructure layer. And again, uh, there are a bunch of terms there with respect to what the kind of deep learning frameworks that we use. A couple of them are mentioned there, like 
TensorFlow and Apache MXNet and PyTorch, and some of you may be familiar with that. At AWS and Amazon, what we do is being framework agnostic. What that means is that it doesn't matter what framework you want to use. You would have the same experience when using machine learning using those frameworks. So we give you the support for those frameworks in a completely optimized and managed way to give you the optimal performance in a way that you want to use it. Similarly, on the infrastructure side, of course, one of our uh, you know, foundation services is our compute and storage services, the EC2 platform, which uh, hopefully you're familiar with. And so what we do is provide that scalability within EC2 and different aspects of EC2 to manage and deploy your machine learning models. Now, let me go back to the uh, statement I made that why did we build SageMaker, right? Why, what is the need to build SageMaker? When we talked to a lot of customers, when we went down this journey, the common theme or feedback we got was that machine learning can be complicated. It takes time, it's time consuming, it's, uh, it's complex, it's not easy. And why is that so? Because if you look at the bottom, there are various aspects or steps uh, you need to do before getting your machine learning model from a, uh, a concept or from your thought to actual deployment production, which is applicable for your business, right? Let's start from the very beginning is data. Data is the kind of foundation of any machine learning, right? The more data you have, the more uh, you know, aspects of the data you have, the better your machine learning model is gonna be because machine learning learns, the learning is done through more and more data as it becomes available. But it just doesn't stop there. Data has got multiple aspects to it. There's, you have to collect the data, of course, but as all of us probably know, raw data is not easily consumable, right? You have data, it's, it's adulterated, it's not easy to use, so it has to be cleaned, it has to be prepared. So you have to go through a process of preparing the data before it can be actually used. Let me take an example if you talk about data, right? Say you want to build a model, uh, you know, you are in the, uh, in the airport business, you're in the airport, you want to build a model to perhaps predict flight delays, right? There, there are various aspects of flight delay. Now, if I could take two examples, if I say, you know, there is perhaps uh, low temperature, high humidity, not in Vegas, but other, other parts of the world, uh, maybe the, uh, the runway is icy and the, the flight is not able to take off. Right? So that could be one aspect of how you want to build your data. But that need not be the only aspects of data. Right? There could be aspects of how old the aircraft is, uh, how tired the fleet has been flying. Maybe if they've had a 20 hour flight and if you're trying to, they're gonna be, they're gonna be uh, taking time to get ready for the next flight. So the, uh, the point is that the data needs to be collected and prepared before it's actually usable for your uh, requirements. Once you have that, uh, machine learning has an aspect called the algorithm. The algorithm is a set of variables which actually uh, kind of help you to address your use case. So there are algorithms for address maybe classification and regression problems, maybe to predict customer churn, maybe to uh, you know, forecast analysis and so on and so forth. Right? So that algorithm has to be chosen in the right way and it has to be optimized. That means it has to perform at the level you need for your business. Now, once you have done that, then you go to training. Training is an important aspect because, as you know, the training aspect, once you train the model, is when you would actually uh, make it applicable to give you the prediction, to make it accurate for your business. Right? So you need to have an environment which can help you train that, uh, train that model. And then you'll have to maybe go back and forth on optimizing it because training is, is, is an iterative process, right? You'll have to go through a trial and error process. And then eventually you want to deploy the model. That means you need to have the infrastructure to deploy the model in production. So as you can see, this whole process has multiple steps before you can take a model from the concept to actually deploying it and making it work for you in your environment. And that's why we built SageMaker. So the objective behind SageMaker was to overcome those barriers to kind of make it easier at every step along the way. So SageMaker is a complete modular platform. What that means is that every part of SageMaker is a separate module, so you can use it the way you want it. 
Maybe you wanted to just build a, build a, a machine learning model or other aspects for it. So we give you that flexibility within SageMaker to make that module work for you in a way you want to consume it. Going back to collecting and preparing data, so what we do within SageMaker is to give you what we call as pre-built notebooks. These notebooks, for those of you who are familiar with the Jupyter interface, it's a very uh, popular and easy interface with developers. So we give you these notebooks in that Jupyter interface for you to use as is. That means you can use these notebooks as is. These are open source notebooks. So all you got to do is to perhaps substitute the data which is in those notebooks with your own relevant data and use it for problems. And what I have here is just a few examples. We keep adding notebooks. If you go to uh, SageMaker, actually you would see the list of notebooks. It's explained in a very easy text to read manner and you can use these notebooks the way you want it. Right. Uh, so I have some examples for recommendation, of fraud detection, and so on and so forth, where you can use these notebooks uh, you know, right away. Now, one aspect of preparation or building is that successful models require high quality uh, training data set. What that means is you've got to label the data. Now, if you look at that image, what I have, there are different aspects of that image. There are vehicles on the road, which you might have to label talking that these are vehicles so that the model understands. There is a person crossing the road, so you might have to label him or her when they are crossing the road. There could be other aspects of it. There is a, a sign which says prepare to stop. There, is, there could be a, a traffic light and so on and so forth. So each aspect of that needs to be labeling and labeling is, again, uh, it's expensive and it's very time consuming and to overcome the aspect of labeling, we built a service called SageMaker Ground Truth. Now, I remember I told you SageMaker has become a suite of services. So this is one service within that suite of services. So how does Ground Truth work is that Ground Truth uses machine learning to learn from human labelers. So if, if I'm a human labeler who has labeled a particular image, the machine learning model within Ground Truth learns that it has been labeled a particular person an uh, animal, a tree, uh, a basketball hoop, or whatever it may be, and going forward, the machine learning model automatically labels it for you with higher accuracy and faster time. So that's what a SageMaker. So the eventual goal for SageMaker Ground Truth is to give you the training data with the highest accuracy at the lowest cost. So labeling is one aspect of machine learning which we have addressed with Ground Truth, and these label training data sets can be used onto SageMaker right away. Let's talk about algorithms. I talked to you that you know, when you have to do on your own, you have to choose and optimize your algorithm to perform at a necessary level needed for your business. What we do within SageMaker is to provide you with built-in algorithms and frameworks. That means these algorithms, again, are open source algorithms. Uh, uh, some of the examples are given on the left bottom there, where you can choose these algorithms. You know, for those of you who are familiar with algorithms for classification and regression like XGBoost, maybe you want to use a forecast algorithm like Deep AR and so on and so forth. And these algorithms are available for you to use within SageMaker. That means you can go to SageMaker and choose algorithms as is. But we didn't stop there, right? We said that uh, customers told us, this is fantastic, this is great, but I have built my own algorithm, right? I have this algorithm, which I have with. I don't want to use the built-in algorithms, but I want to use the other aspects of SageMaker with my algorithm. That's perfectly fine, and that's why I said bring your own, which means that you could have your custom algorithm, which you have built. You bring it into SageMaker in a Docker container and experience the same power and optimization of SageMaker with your algorithm. So you see the flexibility there that you could use the built-in algorithms for those of you who want to use it or bring your own algorithm. But again, we didn't stop there either because there was some more feedback from customers saying that how can I get a wider selection, more flexibility with algorithms? So there is this digital catalog within AWS called AWS Marketplace. So what we did was we launched a digital catalog for marketplace for machine learning. What that enables you is to provide you as a buyer or a seller. If you're a seller, a seller could be an individual, 
an ISV, a company, whoever it could be, you could put your machine learning algorithms and models that you have built within it <coughs> on marketplace for others to use. So that is a monetization opportunity for you to do. As a buyer, you get a broad selection, a wider selection of algorithms and models, which perhaps your peers in the industry have done it, and you have some reference point, and you can use it as is as well. So this opens up the flexibility and choice of algorithms. So we have, uh, as of now, I could be dated here, we have about over 200 algorithms and models on Marketplace, which you could use in addition to uh, using the ones which are built into the SageMaker as well as bringing your own. And all models and algorithms within, uh, Sage, within the marketplace can be used in SageMaker. Moving on, uh, I talked about training. Training is tricky. It, it is um, because you need to have the right environment. When I talk about the right environment, it, you need to have either the right API calls or, and you need to have the right infrastructure to train your models. And when I talk about right infrastructure, you need to have the infrastructure which can scale depending on the requirements of training, right? So that's, that's not easy always. So what we did within SageMaker was to what we call as one-click training. Uh, what one-click training means is basically it is as is. It's a single click. So if you're using uh, the uh, management console, with this, which is the UX, the user interface within SageMaker, it, within a single click, you can actually train your models. For those of you who are, who are in love with your APIs, we give you an uh, API, so it's a single API call which you make to train your models. So what this does is you can train with either the built-in algorithms or your own algorithms. The training is distributed by default over a cluster so that you get the best performance and it's not memory bound. So training is, uh, is, is easily managed within the infrastructure and the training infrastructure is provided to you either with an API call or on the, uh, the console for you to use. And I did mention about training is an iterative process. You never stop with training a model once. Why, do you, why don't you stop? Because you need that level of accuracy. You need to constantly iterate your model. Perhaps you, have, uh, you get more data. Perhaps you have got more parameters on your existing data. There could be various uh, reasons for you to iterate the training. And you need to train more than once. More often than not, it's a trial and error, which you do automatically, right? So you need to go back and train your data again, uh, get more data, clean up the data, and you know, go over the process again. So within SageMaker, we give you that module within training. There are features within the training module itself where you can optimize your model to get you that level of accuracy where maybe it's you want a 90% accurate model so that it predicts the right outcomes for your business. Right? So that is the model optimization is built in within the training module of, of SageMaker as well. You've built your model, you've trained your model, obviously you wanted to deploy the model into production. Right? So deployment is again similar to what we call as training, we call it as a one-click deployment. And the reason we do it as, again, repeating myself here, it's a single API call, right? You have a single API call to deploy your model into production. You have things which you can do in deployment, like you can do A-B tests, maybe for different aspects of deployment and to see what performs better. So that flexibility is given to you. Uh, typically, deployment is done with the highest performing infrastructure. You can choose the infrastructure that you want. It could be a CPU-based virtual machine, what we call as an instance within AWS, or it could be if you have a large amount of data needing complex uh, computation and needs to be trained, you could use a GPU instance. So we give you that flexibility of different types of instances or virtual machines. These virtual machines could be, again, it could be based on memory, it could be based on compute, it could be based on a combination of both, uh, a CPU-based or a GPU-based virtual machine, which you could use uh, with, within, and we provide you with uh, the right SDK as well for, uh, for deployment. Right. Uh, so lastly, the, when, we, when I talk about deployment, it's, it's also about scalability and uh, managing the production environment. Let me take an example of Amazon itself. Right? We know that uh, during the holiday season, 
uh, we are going to get a lot of traffic. Obviously, we have a lot of deals going on. That means the infrastructure at the back end of our retail operation has to scale up to meet that demand. Right? So that's what I mean by scaling, and it's called auto-scaling. And perhaps after the holiday season, maybe there is a lull. It's a quiet period where we might have to bring down that infrastructure, scale down that infrastructure. So that automatic management of the infrastructure, which we call as auto-scaling, is done, is managed for you within the deployment uh, environment. So what I talk to you briefly within the last 25, 30 minutes, or 25 minutes or so, is that SageMaker is this. It enables you to build, train, and deploy machine learning models at scale. And it is a complete modular platform. That means you can choose the module that you can use SageMaker end to end, or you can choose the module that works for you. Perhaps you want to use SageMaker for training. Perhaps you want to use it for deployment. Right? You, you, you choose the module you want it. It's a complete modular platform. The APIs are easy to use. And last but not the least, SageMaker, you can try SageMaker today for free. What I mean is that for those of you who are familiar with AWS services, uh, a lot of AWS services come with something called a free tier. That means for you to try this, you could use SageMaker for free for a, for a particular time with a particular instance and see how it works for you and use that module. So this is SageMaker, and this is a perfect uh, segue into inviting my guest, Dr. Arndt, who's going to tell us how SageMaker is used in their own environment. Welcome, Dr. Arndt. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you so, so much, Yam, for the kind invitation. And thank you so much, dear audience, for allowing me to finish off the conference. I think this is the last talk anyway you will hear during Remars 2019. Um, I hope you enjoyed it so far. I certainly did. So thanks for, for, uh, for, to Amazon for inviting me to the conference and uh, spending the, some, some great days in Las Vegas. It's actually not the first time I've been here. Um, I've been here three years ago or so again, uh, just for one day. I actually don't remember so much of it. Um, but I guess uh, that's, that's quite common. And it says, if you are in Vegas, or what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Um, for me, this in, for the conference is not so true because I hope lots of the things that, that uh, you learned in the keynotes or in the past sessions will actually leave Vegas and you can take them home with you and, um, and linger with you so that you can have some advancement in your own professional life. Some of it from yesterday and, and the keynote and the session yesterday from uh, which, which I attended was, uh, was on investing into technology uh, actually lingered with me and he talked, um, uh, actually I'm going to start the, my talk a little bit different, don't get a heart attack, um, but actually a lot of the times during this conference we saw pictures from Star Trek and uh, the, the Starship Enterprise and I'm a huge fan of, of this franchise and uh, I know most of the episodes by heart. Um, and it seems like when you listen to things like Alexa or Alexa Guard, it seems like Amazon wants to do, to create something like an enterprise computer who is everywhere and which you can just talk to and ask about things. And um, what I think the, the enterprise computer is about, that it is ubiquitously aware of its surroundings. So um, it will just know what is happening around it in, in, every, in every corridor, in every Jeffrey's tube, it will know what's, what's going on and happen. And um, this can be like the, the final version of what we today would call digitization. And digitization, of course, is done so far by lots of big companies like Bosch and uh, IFM and Zig and so many sensor companies that have like a myriad of different sensors in their portfolio, which each put out one value for a specific use case. And uh, so what, what companies are doing right now is to, in order to have like a ubiquitous um, awareness of our environment is to put all of those sensors into the Internet of Things and try to get a grasp of our environment. And this works somewhat well, um, but the computer could never get an understanding of, of the environment in which we live in, not as similar as we humans can. Because if there is a use case which so far there is no sensor for it, we as a humans, we have, we have just a very few um, general sensors and then we can use our brain to learn to get to know this use case and uh, then we can work with it. And this is an idea that we at Zolitron Technology want to bring into like, the world of, of, of IT and of machine learning, and we are going to call this uh, um, cognitive, uh, cognitive sensing. And to get you an idea on cognitive sensing, we've actually prepared a small video for the, for the conference, which I want to show to you right now, and I hope you enjoy it, 
And uh, I would just say, uh, let's start the clip. Wouldn't it be awesome if our virtual world would be aware of the world we're actually living in? So many processes could be automated and made simpler for us to live in. Currently, a myriad of sensors digitize single aspects of life. They're expensive, require costly installation, and regular maintenance. Nature has given us just a few multifunctional sensors. Our eyes, our ears, and after years, our brain is learning how to interpret these signals. Your sensory organs are used for a wide variety of daily tasks, all because our brain has learned to correctly interpret their data stream. We're teaching technology how to do this with cognitive sensing by combining an autonomous sensor with deep learning software in the cloud. Our Z node combines several multifunctional sensors in a single, cheap, tough, and easy to install wireless sensor. Using micro-energy harvesting, it produces data for more than 10 years without changing batteries. One can easily install tens of thousands of these devices without having to worry about costs running away. Our Z Cloud receives data from all Z nodes through narrowband IoT connection. Then, deep learning algorithms get to know the surrounding of each Z node and learn how to interpret the data, similarly to how humans would be able to. Rather than costly installing an ultrasonic sensor for measuring the filling level inside the waste container, Z Cloud learns to interpret the vibration patterns from tossing in waste, and neural networks calculate the filling level of each container, optimizing logistic processes. It analyzes vibration, noise, and magnetic fields of cars to see which ones are allowed to park and which ones are not. So many more use cases are conceivable, like keeping public restrooms well maintained, people detection, traffic monitoring, optimizing public transport, and many more in logistics, infrastructure, and industry. Soon, you will be able to develop your own use cases using Znode and ZCloud and share them with other users. That way, we aim towards a seamless integration of virtual and real world. We are Zolatron Technology. All right, thank you so much for your attention. So, as it stated in the video very shortly, um, we've come up basically with a, with a platform technology for performing cognitive sensing, uh, which is something that I want to uh, feed you through just right now. So when you want to have a myriad of sensors basically placed everywhere to be ubiqui ubiquitously aware of our environment, uh, what we actually have to do is um, to have not a myriad of different sensors. We just need one cognitive sensor for every use case. It must be like a multifunctional sensor. We can't have um, different varieties which would increase production costs. It needs to be one cheap, easy to install, maintenance-free sensor. Easy installation includes just sticking it on, quickly registering with the app, two-minute process, that's it, nothing more. No wiring cables, no putting up of a wireless LAN or local communication infrastructure, nothing of that sort. Um, we, if we have like tens of thousands of those devices, we cannot have battery change or we cannot have some sort of regular maintenance. So it needs to be self-sufficient, it needs to be self-maintained for more than 10 years, which is what, uh, what we promise to our customers. And this combined results in a very, very low total cost of ownership, and this makes the technology uh, ex extremely scalable. So as presented in the video, um, it's, it's like a software and hardware synergy um, which, we, uh, which we presented. On the, on the left hand, you see our Z node. I have one here, it looks like this, it's about this size. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cheap, robust, stupid, replaceable sensor. Um, it's made in a way so that it's very uh, robust against like the outside influences, also um, maybe vandalism or maltreatment would be an issue, so you can just have it drop and stump on it. Nothing is going to happen with it. Um, it combines several different, uh, different sensors, like an accelerometer, magnetometer, GPS uh, tracker, and much more. And then it sends this data over the course of 10 years, just compressed, not pre-analyzed or so, um, there is no, no intelligence on the hardware so far. It sends it um, via several communication standards onto the cloud. Um, at the moment, um, the, most, the most important of this is narrowband IoT. I'm not certain if you're familiar with narrowband IoT. It's like an LTE derivative. 
Uh, on the one hand, our telecommunications providers provide us with things like 4G, 5G, and you can stream Netflix, and you have gigabits per second, and so on. And um, that's very impressive, but it's also very expensive, both money-wise and for, for battery consumption. And this is something that, for the sensor world and for the Internet of Things, it's not so, so great. So they have a parallel development, where they, in parallel, develop things for, like, IoT sensors, which are very cost-effective, which don't require so much power, and which just trans, uh, transmit a few kilobits per second. And one of those technologies is, is narrowband IoT. It's, an, as I said, an LTE derivative. There's also, also in the United States, LTE um, CUT M1, which we also support, and as a, still as a, as a um, fallback technology, still GSM. Also, you have for local communication, um, Bluetooth and near-field communication, which we use to communicate with our app. Um, that's something we do out of necessity. And um, this data, when it's transformed uh, to the database, which is, of course, run by AWS, uh, we call it the Z Cloud. There, this compressed data stream will be uh, used to teach machine learning algorithms, which I'm going to present to you in great detail later on. And uh, there's going to have some, uh, some, some uh, good learnings from it. So the next slide, please don't, uh, please don't, uh, don't be scared. Um, it's something about the server infrastructure. Um, everything is like hosted on, on AWS, as I said. And the thing about uh, these low power wide area uh, network communications like, um, like narrowband IoT or CAT M1, um, they're non-IP based. So they try to remove as much overhead on your, on your data packages as possible. So they don't require IP communication. So what we have actually made is, um, together with our telecommunications provider, Deutsche Telekom, um, the mother of T-Mobile here in, in Germany, um, they created two APN gateways, gate, server gateways for us, so that um, each Z node sends its, its data directly to one of our APN servers, and this tunnels the data directly into the, uh, the AWS uh, servers that we are uh, we're subscribed to um, through VPN gateways both for um, IP and non-IP based communications. And there we have, um, we have dockerized or containers, uh, containers running, which can interpret this data and store it and, and put it in our queues um, for two active Z nodes and for two million active Z nodes. And this is something really amazing that AWS, uh, as like a one-stop shop effort offers you to be able to have this, this scaled so easily um, without having so much, so much manpower working on it. Okay, um, the next part is, as, you, as you've seen it in the, in, the, in, the, in the topic of this conversation, I want to uh, focus on one specific use case. You saw in the video there are so many use cases. Um, so beforehand we picked one, um, which is something really interesting. It's about filling levels and the algorithms that's behind filling level. Um, so um, here is a picture uh, taken uh, in Germany, in Wuppertal. And you see our, our Z node, actually a prototype Z node, stuck on, on, a, uh, on a bottle uh, bank where we collect um, glass for, to be recycled soon. And um, those containers, there are a couple of hundreds um, dispersed over the city. And uh, the trash collection companies that operate those, they would like to know the filling level of each container so that they can only pick up actually full containers. Um, right now, we see from our data that it's sometimes picked up when it's only half full or so, and they could save um, personnel costs, they could save emissions in a, in a crowded city potentially. Um, so these are very, very strong drivers of, of technology. And what they do at the moment, um, there, is a, there is a technology existing for this. Um, it's, it's a short excursion to ultrasonic sensors. There are about 10 or 15 companies uh, that make these ultrasonic sensors. It's one in the middle here. And uh, it's, it's very, um, very tedious to install such sensors. It's, uh, the, the container needs to be towed into the machine shop. It needs to be opened. This thing needs to be, um, needs to be screwed into place. Then you, because it's, it's like a Faraday container, it needs to be, a wire needs to be run out to the outside of the container. And it takes forever. Our good, um, our good provider of, of, these, uh, of these trash collection services in Bochum, um, it's, it's a really nice company, USB. Um, we bought 50 of those ultrasonic uh, sensors to label our data, um, and within three months, we managed to put up 20 of those. And then afterwards, we say, okay, it's enough. Uh, we, we can work with it, and it's just so tedious. And you could never uh, equip hundreds of those containers with it and actually do proper route optimization with real-time data. So we come up with an alternative, and we're using cognitive sensing, of course, to do this. Cognitive sensing saves you about... Uh, one order of magnitude of digitization cost between, because it's just so easy to do. 
we're not directly measuring the filling level, but what we actually measure is, um, is the vibration of those containers because we saw that the, the, the employees of this, of this trash collection uh, company, they don't look inside the container. They knock against it or they kick against it and they just listen if it sounds hollow or if it sounds dull and then they say, yeah, it can be picked up and, and, and be towed away. So the vibration that is caused by stuff being thrown into it um, is dependent on the material, on the container type and on the filling level. We know the material, we know the container type, um, we just want to find out the filling level, and this we can easily, or this we can do with, uh, with machine learning. Um, in the following few slides, I actually want to guide you a little bit through the algorithms that we're using for this detection of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of filling level. And it's gonna get a little bit dry, but I would like you to be still patient with me. It's just a very few slides, and I'm, I hope I can make this as, as, uh, as, as fun as possible for you. So it's actually a two-stage process. I told you already that uh, narrowband IoT offers you just very narrow data bandwidth. So actually we're limited to one megabyte of data per month. And uh, that's, that's, that's not very much. Um, it's cheap, but we cannot, we cannot go more than, than one megabyte per month. We try to argue with our telecommunications provider. Um, so we need to do some comp compression on the device itself. We need to decompress it. And then there's this decompressed trace we can actually send through uh, Amazon SageMaker and get our filling level algorithm running, which then requires the, um, uh, the parts, yeah. So Xiam asked me, um, his, his talk, he presented all the different parts of Amazon SageMaker. I actually want to show you um, a screenshot of what it actually looks like when, when you use it. This is uh, actually um, a big thanks to my, my colleagues here, Ali, Sairam, Linus, who are working on this and who've had the patience to teach a mechanical engineer by training on how to use uh, or how to, how to explain machine learning um, to you all who are, I bet, better qualified at understanding this. Um, this is what it looks like, and you can just have it running on your, uh, on your computer. You have the computing power of an AWS data center in, 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 um, behind you, and you can run your Jupyter uh, notebook and run all your algorithms, and uh, so far from what I've seen, um, it's really, really useful so that even I can understand it. What you actually do with it is that, first of all, you prepare your data. Of course, our data is presented to us by, by the Z node and by the tunnel. Um, which we force uh, feed through um, to a database. We import it into SageMaker and uh, we import it into our Jupyter notebook. And from there on we have the, the algorithm selection, which we do dependent on, uh, on the, the filling material, of course. We can select the training material, the training data, we can train the, um, the algorithm. And then what's really nice about SageMaker is that because all of our databases and the access of our customers to our database is also in AWS, we can have an endpoint where the resulting filling level is actually put out. So this, uh, this feature is something that we can really easily tap into. First, compression algorithm. That is something uh, which I talked to you about because we have this, this narrowband uh, uh, data limit. So this is one of the, the, the vibration patterns that come out of the accelerometer, and it's 32 kilobytes in size. And if you now think, okay, maybe there is 1,000 bottles being thrown into one container per month, it's 32 megabytes, which is way above our limit of one megabyte per month, which we have. So um, we have the advantage that all of these vibration patterns, they're very similar. So if we would allow lossy compression and we would allow um, uh, just to focus on this, this very, very specific vibration patterns, we can actually train a, um, a symmetric neural network, force it to have, uh, to have less and less nodes every time, and then force them to compress this data stream. The first part is something that we export into the, into the embedded software in our Z node. It does the compression, and from 32 kilobytes, it goes to roughly 800 bytes, which is a tremendous compression rate um, that we can get. And with 800 bytes, we can actually reasonably work with in, in this use case of, uh, of filling level for trash collection. The second part is, of course, done in the Z cloud, so on, on, on SageMaker, and um, the resulting reconstruction looks very, very similar. It's, as I said, it's lossy compression. It doesn't, it's, it's not the exact representation, but it's, it's very similar. The quality is also really good. If you look at it, we had 25,000 traces in, in, this, in this training data set, and 77% um, are 90% uh, reconstruction quality plus. Um, this is a really good thing. The remaining percentages uh, below 90%, those are probably events that are not glass bottles being fed into the container. This can be anything. People bumping into the container, squirrels running over this, the, the node. It could be anything. Um, and if you look where we actually lose this data in the 90% in the regime, it's mostly noise. 
um, the peak positions and the peak magnitude is still, is still preserved, and this is something where we can uh, really well work with. So at the beginning, um, before we had enough data to feed, uh, to train a neural network algorithm, um, what we went with is we actually went with a conventional algorithm. So we took the compressed traces, uh, we decompressed them, and then make up three categories. The one category is a bad signal. This is just a signal which I described as just a random signal, someone bumping into the container, not a bottle throwing into the container event. Um, the second category is emptying. So when the container is being picked up, you have a very specific, um, uh, a very specific um, vibration pattern. We can detect this with very high accuracy, above 98%. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the last category. The, the majority of, of traces are being sorted into the good kind of quality, and we know how many bottles fit into one specific container type. So what we can, of course, do is we can do a counting. Every time there is a good bottle, we can, we can use this, and um, we can have the emptying set back to zero. And with this, we have a very, very good um, quantification of the filling level of one glass container. But this is, of course, not what we want, because a glass container can be susceptible to changes. It can be replaced somewhere. Um, and also, we don't just want to look at glass containers. We want to be agnostic towards the filling material. So what we actually need to have is an, is an algorithm that adapts to the kind of data that is, that is being fed to it. Um, so we quickly uh, switched to, to neural networks as soon as we had enough data. And of course, we fed the traces to it. And then we had some issues with the labels. As I, as I just told you, putting up ultrasonic sensors for labeling our data is, is very, very costly and doesn't work really well. So um, we tried to augment this data in, in our app. Our customers can actually, when they pick up the, the container, they can set manually the filling level. Um, we also have, have, have students regularly driving around, checking the filling level of the containers, labeling the vibration patterns. Um, and we, um, uh, we also do something where we have, can use the, the counting algorithm to also augment the, the data set that we actually see. So um, this way, using labels, we, uh, we want to label them into five categories. This filling level, five categories, that's fine. We don't need more precision. Our customers are fine with this, with this sort of precision. And we trained, uh, we trained our neural networks with it. And if you can see um, that we reach 71% accuracy. So if you would randomly put a trace into one of those five boxes, you would have 20% um, uh, probability to put it into the actually right box. And after running it through the algorithm, you have 71% accuracy. And because we get so many signals, we can just collect a bunch of them, put them into the box which we think is right, and then come up with a histogram. And of course, the peak position is, again, um, the accurate filling level. You can even augment this data with historic data. For example, if the container was completely empty yesterday, then it cannot be 100% or it will be very unlikely to be 100% full tomorrow if there are only a few traces um, that, that we collected. Also, you can add calendaric data. If there is, for example, New Year's Eve or a public holiday, presumably it will be, it will be fuller soon. So this way we can also have uh, predictive algorithms which our customers greatly appreciate. The next thing which I'm just going to give a brief outlook of is something which we call uh, working with short-term Fourier transformations. So um, we so far worked in the, in the time domain, but we want to shift this vibration into the frequency domain, so we make a Fourier transformation with it. And uh, using short-term Fourier transformation, we cut off every one of those vibrations into, into short segments, and for each segment do a Fourier transformation, analyze what kind of frequencies are apparent, and then you come up with, um, with this sort of like a picture for each, each axis, and we combine these axes, and uh, we end up with a feature vector, and it looks like an image. And there are so many, um, so many algorithms already existing on SageMaker for image analysis and uh, categorization of images that you can actually use vibration data um, in, in combination with, uh, with algorithms that are used for um, analysis of, of pictures and, uh, and, and video data. So what we do, um, we feed this into, into SageMaker. For this, where we're using convolutional neural network with uh, long short-term memory. And we feed the result to an endpoint. As I just said, the endpoint is also located into, into AWS, same as our API, which we run. And this, uh, this API we present, to our, we present to our customers. All of our customers have their, their own IT infrastructure, and they can easily um, hook up to our API and just get the fitting level of their, uh, of their containers, which they're interested in. OK, customer perspective. Now I want to tell you about why you, should, why you should do it, or why our customers love doing it. And I want to tell you the story about USB. 
USB, as I said, told you before, is, is a trash collection company of the town where we're actually living in. Uh, Bochum, Bochum is an is a old town with a, with a, with a mining, uh, coal mining background. And um, there are also, there's also a very big university where we're a spin-off company from. And um, more and more institutes and students come and join the university and are actually moving to Bochum. So we have more and more population. At the moment, there were 36, uh, 365,000 residents living in Bochum and um, more every year. So what USP needs to do is they need to find ways to optimize the processes in order to be able to cope with the increasing, with the increasing population and also not do this with just adding personnel because for them it's really hard also to get qualified personnel to drive those specialized pickup trucks and so on. It's not easy for them. So we found out during our, excuse me, during our test, um, during our test run that um, they can save around 40% of their logistics costs. This is, for example, one, one graph of one of their containers, and you can see that it's about emptied halfway, or it's, it's like 50, 50 to 60% of, uh, of the container filling levels. So we had them, okay, this container, it doesn't need to be emptied so often. You can just adjust it. And uh, they did, and they emptied it at uh, almost 100% filling level, which is, as of course, the way it should be. Here's the, the CEO of, um, of the USB company, um, uh, Dr. Cizowski. He's, uh, he's a very dear customer of ours, and he's um, the leader of this municipal waste collection company. And the way they work is they have a, a flat fee which they receive from a, from a, a government institution for collecting glass, paper, uh, old clothing, and they cannot do anything about this flat fee. It's, uh, it, it's independent of how much they collect and how often they collect. They, they just get it based on how many residents they service. Uh, so what they can actually do, they can work on saving costs for, for pickups and for logistics. One pickup is about 35 euros or 30, 38, 39 dollars, um, which is really expensive. And there are 1,300 containers uh, in Bochum. And if we say you can save 40% of the, of, the, of the pickups, then that's an enormous, uh, enormous uh, amount of, of saving that they can actually do. And of course, using cognitive sensing with, with our approach is very, very scalable, very reasonable to, to install and um, they, are, they have a very, very short return of investment. For private waste collection companies, it's, it's even, even more tantalizing because um, they have to apply for concessions uh, if they want to do the waste collection in a, in a city or in a region, and this whole industry is very price competitive. So if they have the opportunity to save 40% of the costs without having to skimp on the service um, using sensors and digitization, then that's a real, a real plus for them. I want to take the last few minutes of our, of, our, of our session to talk with you about our vision. As, I, as I'm sure you know by now, um, trash collection isn't the only thing we do. We aspire to seamless interlink between like, the real and the virtual world. As I said before, we want to be ubiquitously aware of our environments, same as the, as the enterprise computer. And the way we want to do is we want to advance our self-learning AI to be use case agnostic. We don't want to teach it use cases every time we have a new use case. Um, we want it to just know where it is, what's happening around it, and what's, what's doing it. And this is, of course, a, uh, a question of edge computing. Our cloud needs to be better, and our embedded software needs to be smarter. And this both needs to work in conjunction. What we can also imagine is for you guys to have sort of like a marketplace of third-party applications. You as developers can use our platform technology. If you have an interesting use case, you can use our platform. And, uh, and make use of it and come up with a, with a new use case, put it up on the marketplace, and maybe there are, there are other people, other companies that are also interested in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this application. So in the end, what we imagine is that we would have uh, millions of those Z nodes around digitizing our environment in a, um, in a holistic fashion and bridging the gap between virtual and real world. And I would like for you to share our vision and uh, if, you, if you are uh, looking for, for any further information, I think we have five more minutes left uh, to have some, a little bit of Q&A session. I will also be available afterwards. And um, so far, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to welcome Xiam back into, into the talk so that he can wrap everything up. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ant. It is wonderful to see uh, how SageMaker as, quote-unquote, a geeky 
service can be used in a real world application. So I just wanted to thank again everybody for being here, staying here the last session of the day. And also want to leave you with uh, a couple of resources which perhaps you want to try SageMaker today. Uh, as, as Aunt mentioned, that's one aspect of it. We have other use cases, uh, hopefully Z node is one of the use cases which has rung a bell. And you know, from our resources, we have uh, the product page, which is rich in, uh, in content. We have a rich repository of blogs written by SMEs, by customers, by partners, and by AWS personnel. And, uh, and, and last but not the least, as I said, you can try SageMaker for free today. We have a 10-minute tutorial. Our goal is for our customers to make uh, use of SageMaker to build, train, and deploy models in 10 minutes. Uh, so the links are there. Uh, the slides will be shared with all of you after the conference. And uh, thank you again. And we are here if you have any questions.